Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for traveling up the stairs and into this parallel session. If you are tweeting from the session, please use the hashtag SIF14C. The uh, title of this session, just so that you know that you're in the right room, is Building Transnational Epistemic Communities Around Cybersecurity. Okay. You're in the right room. <laughs> Okay, my name is Emily Taylor. I'm the CEO of Guard UK, an online brand protection company, and conduct research into various aspects of internet governance. So my first question is actually to you, the audience. Um, without looking it up, how many of you knew what epistemic means? Okay, very good. So... Anybody volunteer to, to tell everybody what it means? Everyone else? Oh. Okay. Yes, this is about knowledge communities. So you have to ask the PhD students because it's in their exam. <laughs> I should have excluded anyone from the citizen lab. Right. Okay, well, well done. That was, a, that was a much more of a response than I was expecting. We have a, a wonderful panel here today, but I'm also expecting a lot of participation from you today in the room and also um, through the Twitter feed. We have our online moderators, uh, Gita and Marcin, there in the corner, and so I will be coming to you in due course. So um, let me just introduce the panel. On my left is Professor Ron Debert of the Citizen Lab, who will be known to many of you. Uh, the Citizen Lab is part of the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto. Over there on the far, on the far end is uh, Patrick Falstrom, Head of Research and Development at NetNod, <coughs> Chair of ICANN's Security and Stability Advisory Committee, and uh, very involved in all aspects of um, internet standard setting, which is uh, something we'll be talking about today. Moez Chachuk uh, is the CEO of the ATI in Tunisia, which was previously the body uh, in charge of internet censorship and is going through a transition which is uh, very relevant to our discussions. Renata Avila Pinto is a human rights lawyer researcher for Cyber Stewards Network and currently leading the Web We Want initiative for the Web Foundation with Sir Tim Berners-Lee and others. Uh, Enrique Pirates, mm -hmm. Vice President of the Human Rights Programme at Benetech, a civil society organisation. And last but very, certainly not least, uh, Simone Hallink, a Senior Policy Officer with the Dutch Ministry for Foreign Affairs. Now, before we get started with our discussions, what I'd like you to do, and using the hashtag SIF14C, is to tweet your example of the greatest benefits arising from the collaborative way of working in these knowledge communities. Um, uh, you know, do, do you think that that has actually delivered benefits so far? So you get started with that, and we'll get started with our session. Professor Ron Debert, can I start with you? Could you just set out the background of how it was? Because we can see from the, from the description in the program that there's a sense of loss. Can you just give us some background on that and, sure. and, 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 and the, the trends as you see them? Sure, happy to do so. Uh, I don't think my microphone is on. Should it be on there? Can you I think if you just keep talking, it will catch Hello. up. It'll catch on. Can you hear me? Hello? Maybe I'll shout. Um, first of all, I have to apologize because I am the person who put epistemic in there. And, uh, okay, thanks. Uh, so sorry for that. Uh, I didn't realize it would cause such angst, and I've never had so many people at a, an event come up to me and say, what does epistemic mean? And um, so uh, actually it relates to the question you asked because um, you know, an epistemic community, as Carolina said, is a community of shared knowledge and practice, and the term is a generic term uh, that's used in the academic literature to, to refer to communities of shared scientific knowledge, you know, shared concepts, shared standards, and so on. And the reason I use that in, in coming up with the description for this uh, working group, this session, 
was because I think there's a real crisis in the epistemic community that has essentially secured the internet. And uh, where I first discovered this was a few years ago when I was speaking with uh, people who work in computer emergency response teams. So for those of you who don't know, in, in just about every country, there is a computer emergency response team. And these were formalized uh, out of essentially and mostly the university system. So in the very early, early days of the internet, uh, those who actually kept the internet running tended to be engineers working at universities. Later it was formalized into computer emergency response teams. And the members of this security community were very much an epistemic community. They had a shared understanding of what it is that they wanted to secure. Uh, they operated mostly on the basis of trust and reputation. In fact, the community at one point in time was small enough that most of the members actually knew each other. And I think there are some people on this panel, I think Patrick would probably be one of those people who would consider themselves to be a member of this uh, community once it globalized to a certain extent. Um, a few years ago, I heard some troubling signs, though, uh, that this community was breaking down, uh, that especially the trust and reputation at the heart of it uh, was being eroded. And this is before the Edward Snowden revelations. Uh, the reason for this erosion in trust and reputation in this community is primarily around the emergence of national security concerns. Um, so uh, this community and the fact that they operate on the basis of trust and reputation is very important for the seamless functioning of the internet. So if you're a member of this community and you find out about a specific vulnerability or an exploit, uh, the common practice is to quickly circulate that information to as, as many different members of the community as possible so that can be as efficiently and quickly taken care of. But over time, uh, that practice has subtly changed to the extent where now, today, in national certs, the practices maybe don't share that information so quickly. Maybe instead we should send it upstairs to a different security community, those in the three-letter agencies or the militaries who can actually exploit these vulnerabilities and weaponize them. And uh, that's a, a one simple characterization, I think, of which is a general troubling trend, the introduction of national rivalries and national security issues into this epistemic community. So we're seeing essentially the breakdown of a very important community that for many uh, decades really has been at the core of the functioning of the internet. If that community breaks down, we've got a big problem mm -hmm. because without the trust and reputation that binds that community together, the internet effectively won't function. Thank you very much for that introduction. Patrick Falstrom, do you agree with that analysis? Is this a trend that you have seen as well? Uh, it sounds quite worrying. Um. I see some signs of that, but I would say that um, I agree with Ron when you say that for the actual smooth operation of the internet, that is still how things work. And um, because, because sharing information when you have issues, for example, uh, pure operation issues between ISPs, if you're competitors, it is a sort of built-in by definition hard, is hard problem for two competitors to actually share information with each other that might be things that actually impact competitive and business reasons. So the ability to cooperate is something that is very much built upon individual level and not so much organizational level. So I think um, I characterize the system more like you have the smooth operations, which is built upon sort of the traditional epistemic communities that still exist and sort of still operate things. But then you have, as you say, the more sort of police law enforcement that are told that have the task to actually make sure that certain other kind of things actually still work. And, and that is a different epistemic community, which might not be epistemic based upon the same kind of trust, but more agreements or even treaties between states on how you share information. And is so there, that is there is much interplay thing. between these two? There, there is some, but, the, but to go back to the stress on the first one of these two, which are to do with individuals, I think it's really important to talk about what Ron pointed out, is that it's not only that you participate there and, and because of trust you get to know information, you're also supposed to share. 
So one of these sort of mistrusts that come in is that you do have people that are members of these, of these communities that do not share, but instead use it for their own purpose. And that has to do with sort of, and you see some stress on how to do uh, disclosure, disclosure policies and how that works and how disclosure of various incidents have happened lately. And has this got worse in the last year? I mean, the, the, uh, f could, could you give us some insight into, say, how people within the Internet Engineering Task Force, which, which does a lot of the standards uh, work for the, on which the Internet relies, when it became clear through the Snowden revelations that a lot of those quite open and trusting networks were, had been apparently subverted or that uh, encryption had been deliberately weakened, did that affect the personal relationships within that and what's the yeah. impact? Uh, IETF is slightly different because we need to separate the actual technical uh, development which is done within IETF and the communities that we talked about earlier that has to do with operations of the internet. These are sort of slightly different as well or to large part actually different. In the ITF you, you absolutely got the same kind of trust and people, even engineers, start to, which sort of start with the assumption that the world is good and everyone wants to do a good thing and, and even people that want to make money are bad guys. Now suddenly they start to question whether, for example, the code or the proposal, the proposed standard that people submit to the ITF whether it's actually correct. Mm. And, and you start to ask whether people's affiliation uh, impacted or any other kind of ties impacted the quality of, of, of whatever people uh, submitted, which of course question then, how do you review these kind of uh, sometimes very complicated technical matters? For example, if we take program development, if you, ca if, you cannot, if you start to not trust your compiler, what do you do? If you start to not trust your memory chip that you buy, what do you do? Mm. And, and that's why we see, for example, one initiative called Cryptech, which is trying to do open source hardware and open source software, where the base, the base assumption is that you cannot trust anything. You cannot even trust your compiler. How do you then develop things that can handle crypto keys, for example, to go around, or for example, if you take the heart, heart bleed incident, for example. Okay. So, it, you know, if you So do you think then that, there, that trust has has been rocked? Or are you saying that there, there should never be any trust in the first place? I'm not no, quite, no, I, it's I, probably I, me just not understanding. No, I, I think that if you, if you look at the IETF, I think the standards process have, have, have some work to do there on how to evaluate when you have consensus on the standard that you move forward. In the operational community regarding sort of more, op, more smooth, smooth operations like Ron started to talk about, um, I think that sort of still works. But I think the, 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 the difference between that community and the law enforcement and also that Internet is used for sort of other things now than 15 years ago, um, that together has created some, created some stress. Moez Chachuk, can I come to you, you know, from the point of view, from where you stand in Tunisia and sort of pre-revolution and post-revolution, if I may use that term, how open... Did you find the distributed epistemic communities before the regime changed in Tunisia? Were they open to you? Yeah, it is, I think it's very important to mention that uh, actually the challenge after the revolution is just how to build this, this community, oh. the internet community, because what we believe in today is that we say that we cannot develop the internet. We cannot develop the internet in Tunisia and promote uh, the innovation without involving the community to be part of this uh, global dialogue or the global work of ETF or whatever. The global community played an important role in different means. Uh, if I can mention about uh, how the ITI evolved in these uh, three years, because during these three years, you, you all know that ITI was like uh, uh, very, very well hated by people, by the community, especially because they censored the internet for years, and uh, we have a uh, uh, lot of surveillance also done during these years. The way that we did is that we, we need to be transparent to the community. We need to, to work with the community. We need to open the doors to the community and try to, dis to, to build a new kind of trust. And uh, this trust is very important. And we cannot really work on in a, in a, in a let me say, in a um, uh, complicated environment without being open to the community. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and was the community... Yes. So that's very clearly 
setting out the challenges at the national level, and I want to come back yeah. and talk to you more about that. What I'd like to know is how open the international trust systems were to you and to people in your community a few years ago, particularly the people like you with a very technical background. Yeah. There's a lot of um, barriers for Tunisians and uh, for many developing countries. You know very well that uh, the community is not uh, working very in the same manner when, when it comes with developing world because there is a lot of capacity building required and uh, we know that we don't have the same meaning of, uh, for example, for internet governance. What is the internet governance? What is uh, cyber crime for a country like mine? There is something to be to be to uh, to deal with, and uh, Tunisians have a lot of oh, sorry, have a lot of um, things to to do regarding the, the, these kind of definitions and this and this kind of involvement of the Tunisian community towards the international level. Thank you, Renata Avila. As as part of your your uh, just from where you're sitting in the sort of civil society, um, the the descriptions of these trust communities that Patrick has given and that, that Ron Debert have given, uh, is that your experience? Are those, are those networks of trust open to you? Would it make any difference to the function of the internet if they were? Uh, well, um, I wish, like, honestly, I wish that uh, my friend Jacob Applebaum was here instead of me because he can see the things in a better way than the way that I see it. Or I wish that uh, my friend Laura Poitras was here to explain uh, from the the perspective of someone who had ac more access to information than me. And I think that, that that's at the very center of the problem that we have here with these communities, that some people have this informal access to what's going on. Uh, some people have informal access to everything that's going on and only share it with a small uh, group of countries and, and use it uh, to their advantage or to their advantage of a, a specific uh, uh, th even taking advantage of specific vulnerabilities that they know in advance and they do not inform everyone. Uh, and, and some people, like countries like, me, m like mine and other small countries that do not have the capacity and do not have the access to the information of what re really is going on um, on the internet suffer the consequences. And that's, uh, that secrecy, that uh, pervasive secrecy is it's not discussed, and it's absolutely outside of, of, of the control of these uh, communities of trust and collaboration, and that's a problem. H how that's a problem? Because we are relying on um, that the other, that the, what the other is telling us is true, and that the, what the other is telling us is, is uh, we can rely on the lo knowledge of those who had access to better technology and better uh, teams in, uh, within these communities. But what's really uh, going on, uh, and I invite everyone to watch uh, the talk by Jacob Applebaum that he gave at the Chaos Communication Congress on the 30th of December, uh, which offers a very, very, very dark panorama on how the trust has been broken in all, at all levels. What we have right now is a very unreliable, very insecure platform uh, where um, these insecurities used in advantage, as I said before, of certain countries. And we have uh, me as a human rights lawyer uh, first. I cannot trust policy because it turns out that so certain countries have secret laws that I will never know of. I cannot trust on companies because it turns out that uh, some countries have uh, forced these companies not to disclose me what's really going on inside, inside them. I cannot trust my computer. Because again, some governments have uh, agreed with companies to uh, uh, produce the, the computers and the chips and everything in a way uh, that it makes it uh, uh, vulnerable and insecure by design. And I cannot tr uh, trust my software because of the current copyright uh, protections and patent protections allow that uh, something as basic I ask basic as software is uh, code protected. So uh, I'm in my very, uh, like coming from where I come from and from my profession, I'm, I, I find myself uh, in a position where I cannot trust anything. And I remember that uh, last year in, at SIF, I dismantled my telephone and I said, okay, if I want to have a, a private conversation, we are in a situation that I have to take out my battery and I have to take out my SIM card because I cannot trust that, no, that uh, someone is not listening to my conversations. But now we are at the moment that I feel 
like um, I, that I am putting people in danger if I use my computer to communicate with my past clients and to store sensitive information about human rights abuses. And, and that's something that I'm, I'm really keen to come back to and yeah, we're, we're going to be speaking with, are, with Enrique about. about. Yeah. Yeah. So you are sensing a sort of a, just almost a, a sense oh, of yes. despair exactly. in, ev in every uh, field, which I don't get the sense that Patrick particularly shares, but I think you're well, worried about, aren't you, Ron? Yes, so yeah. But uh, we, we talk about two different kinds of trust here. What I'm talking about is the trust that I have an interest in sharing with others because that makes my life easier when operating, for example, when doing whatever I'm doing. Mm -hmm. The trust that we hear talk about is whether I can trust this thing to yeah. do whatever the vendor has told me and inform it it is. And, that's, and I see those as two slightly different things. Of course, the first is dependent on the second. Yeah. Um, I'd like to just... Uh, Marcin, is anything happening on the Twitter feed? Did we get any response from the questions posed? I don't have a mic. Okay, I'm going to come to you in a second. Does, is anybody in the audience wanting to ask a question at this stage? Can, okay. Can we get a microphone to this lady at the front? And, the, and, and I'm going to take a question from this lady, Marcin, and then come to you. Okay, so line up the, the microphone there. Could you just introduce yourself before you ask the question? My name is yeah. Yeah. My name is Tanya from Costa Rica, Fundación Acceso. And my question is more about epistemic but also ethical communities. And I don't know what your view is on <laughs> ethics. <laughs> on, Who, is countries. there anyone you'd like to particularly No, in general, whoever to? wants to. Who wants answer. to jump in on ethics and epistemics? Yeah. Something quickly. And also ethics for all, because what I see often is a double standard where those more capable share among them, and then uh, did some information bounces to other communities less capable, and that uh, there's a first uh, class uh, sharing and second class sharing, and uh, oh, usually small countries get the death <laughs> later. It's Enrique Pirases from Benetech. So, um, <coughs> oops. Okay, I'll do this briefly. Um, I would like to touch on that, but uh, in just one second. I would like to speak a little bit to what uh, we were told at the beginning around that, uh, how is our defining the problem of trust and uh, around which communities. Uh, and I think that it was, this will speak to, to your question. I think that um, I definitely agree with what uh, both of the first panelists have said. However, I would say that uh, I found that to be uh, incomplete or insufficient at the moment. I think that uh, we may be seeing uh, uh, an erosion in the trust of in such community uh, for other reasons as well. I think that uh, it may be also possible that uh, civil society is playing a different role than in the past, that civil society has not been traditionally part of such communities. Yeah. Those epistemic communities may have been in the past closer to governments, academia, or you know, some uh, uh, techno corporations. Uh, so I would argue, argue that uh, we may see a lack of erosion because uh, civil society may see itself uh, removed from the conversation. Uh, and uh, directly related to that, I also th see that uh, civil society may be, uh, may be able to see uh, these traditional epistemic communities as uh, uh, tremendously close. Uh, and in that sense, I would argue that it's uh, not so hard to equal uh, openness with trustworthiness. Um, and uh, to add to that, um, I would say that uh, there's a few other things that are happening here that are related to the non-traditional epistemic communities, which may explain why uh, trust is unable to grow uh, in, in a sufficient, uh, with a sufficient weight. Um, there are uh, newer uh, communities that are loosely organized uh, around some of the issues that we discussed, that are unable to engage with the traditional communities in a, with the formality that the previous communities may engage, may expect, uh, with a different language, with a different style, with a different need uh, for speed, uh, with a different pace. Uh, one could see that uh, civil society is playing a larger role around issues of citizen science. And in that sense, we could think of hackers as citizen scientists. And if we think about the, the vision that we have of hackers, uh, we can easily understand how they have been removed from some of these conversations. So then I would argue that... But, you know, if you have a community that's um, 
that all know each other and all trust each other, and that functions well, which was the message I was getting in the early interventions. This functions well because the people know each other personally. Then that cannot include everybody, can it? Because then when, that happen, when everyone's involved, then that sort of personal relationship aspect must break down, surely. So if I could intervene at this yes. point. I think it's important to emphasize or to underscore that we're talking about communities in the plural sense. It's mm -hmm. important to, to uh oh, oh God, um, to, to make that, that recognition that there are multiple communities. There are communities at the engineering level, at the standard setting level, uh, the operations level. There are communities of law enforcement, communities in the private sector, academic communities, activist communities. Um, I think we also have to put it in historical perspective. I mentioned a bit of that before about looking at the early internet, but equally important is to understand what's going on now, and especially in the global south. So uh, as it stands now, many countries are coming online very rapidly, and they're having to make choices about standards, about regulation, about institutions, about practices and norms. Uh, those don't arise out of nowhere. It's very important to understand who's doing the training, the educating, the norm transmission. Where is it coming from and how does that impact what's going on? Uh, the case of, of MOAS in Tunisia is very important. Why? Because it's exceptional, right? And it's really because of the, the people of Tunisia and MOAS himself acting as a, a, a constraint against contrary pressures. It's an exception though. If you look at many other parts of the world, there are some very worrying trends because countries inevitably have to stand up law enforcement agencies. They have to think about dealing with cybercrime. How they deal with and define cybercrime is very important. What is the object of security? For many countries, that means dissidents, activists. It means opposition groups. And that could fall within what counts as that which we need to protect ourselves from, which influence technological choices. Uh, how cybercrime gets defined is essential to understand as the next billion uh, digital users come online. Uh, in the in thinking and stepping back and looking at that and, and trying to uh, figure out how we would ever get to a point of ensuring that on a global level there is still a modicum of trust among some of the essential communities that run the internet, I think is a daunting challenge. Mm. And it seems, from, from various points made, it seems incredibly fragile, to, to, to quote James Lewis from the, the, the first panel, that it relies on individuals like Moes, you know, standing up and doing something different, or individuals in, in one or more of these communities. I just, I'm aware that I've told Martin I'm coming to him about 10 minutes ago and didn't happen. So c can we just have a sort of a little summary of the, the way people are responding. And then I'm going to come in, to, uh, get Simone, Simone Hallink involved, and apologies. Of course. Uh, well, the discussion online is still kind of caught in the, in the discourse from the last panel, when, which was talking about privacy, something that is dead. Uh, because that also relates to trust being mm. broken or weakened, at least. And also related to another session that's ongoing in, in this house where uh, Gus Hussein from Privacy International introduced himself as Privacy's Dead International. Uh, so <laughs> the, the, the main comments from, from the internet is actually that this, it might be time to change the narrative into something that's building and not destructive. So are people, are people coming back, you know, I asked a question uh, for the audience to, to tweet the benefits that they, they see these, these informal communities as delivering. Have, have, have anybody come back on that? Oh, we need more tweets for that. We need more yeah. tweets for that. Yeah. Simone Hallink, so you're with the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but previously when you were with um, Bits of Freedom, a civil society organisation, you described the Dutch government as careless with privacy issues. <laughs> and I wonder <laughs> now that you're with the government whether your opinions changed and... You know, I bet you support the right to be forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you perceive a lack of trust? And, uh, and do you perceive the, you know, tell us about how your perspective is, is these days. Hmm, difficult question. Um, I think my perspective, um, I think one of the most difficult things is that I'm confused by the distance between civil society and the government, which... I was truly aware of when I was part of civil society, it was, it was very difficult to reach out to the government. 
Um, but I'm now more shocked by the polarized views and how difficult it is to get parties together when, it, in, at least in my view, we're still fighting for the same cause. And, and is, it, is it because of lack of trust, do you think? I, Trusting sh sure, there is also... Distrust of people's motivations, perhaps, or that they're just being noisy and critical and so we can't talk to them? Sure, I think that's a large part of it, but I'm not entirely sure if it's always lack of trust, but also it could also be lack of understanding. Um, and so I, I find it, it's very difficult to sort of flesh out the right motives or the right interest. Or it, it's just a, I think it's a, it's a conversation, if, if, or if there is a dialogue at all topics, that is very clouded by misunderstanding. Um, and, 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 and there's different levels there. So um, uh, for me as a government official, I have conversations with people from civil society, and, and often there are, um, uh, you know, a, there's a lot of critique with, you know, like with reason, um, but there's often not a solution. I find that very difficult. Yeah. Um, and, and it's not necessarily that I know the solution, so I think it would be very good to have a, I mean, like a conversation about that. Yeah. Um, that was also something that um, I very much experienced when I was working still for Bits of Freedom, where I'm, I'm a lawyer from origin, and so I was always sort of looking more for compromise, and I wasn't, I wasn't an activist per se, I think. It sometimes took me a lot of, lot of effort to troll. Um, but so I was always looking for sort of ways in which you can find more of a compromise or a process where you bring parties more together. Um, and there have been instances in which that has been very successful, which was more behind the scenes or which was more in a sense of writing a policy paper that sort of fitted better into the government perspective and was something they could work with. So, um, sure, there are still, from idealism perspective, from, for me, things that I would like to do my government better. I think that sort of goes for everyone. Well, um, now you can. Yeah, now I can. <laughs> so I'm, I'm working very hard for that. Um, um, but um, but I, I truly sort of what I think is is my 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 main goal, my main aspiration is to, to sort of see how you can actually bring bring groups together to sort of see how you can find proper solutions where different perspectives are taken into account. Ron Debert, yes. Can I just make one quick point that no, no. I think is important to introduce into this conversation we're having, and frankly, I have no answer for it, and it's one of the most troubling things when I think about uh, this area. And that is the, the fact that uh, the area that we're talking about, call it the internet or cyberspace, whatever you want, uh, has become a domain within which militaries are preparing to fight and win wars. And uh, that, that's an important development. Uh, it first started in the 2000s, uh, uh, at least explicitly in the United States when the Pentagon defined cyberspace as a domain equal to land, sea, air, and space and stood up Cyber Command. Um, that has enormous implications internationally. Uh, countries tend to mimic each other. They get concerned about what other countries are doing if they're adversaries. Not surprisingly now, dozens of governments have within their armed forces stood up uh, military units, the equivalent of Cyber Commands, that see this area that we're talking about as something to be fought over, to, to be potentially subverted and destroyed. Uh, especially in, in terms of national rivalries. So you're introducing international rivalries on top of what should be an undifferentiated global communications realm. To me, this is the biggest challenge when it comes to thinking about how to ensure that this system as a whole is secured. But isn't that part and parcel of the expansion of the net? I mean, what really strikes me as we're discussing these communities based on, on individual relationships is how small they are and how it seems impossible to see And we talk in very utopian terms about this wonderful pre-fall type of, of community that was so perfect. I wonder whether it really well, was and whether it scales. I, I think it was inevitable in hindsight that this would happen. I think yeah. you can expect uh, technology like we're talking about to become, as we call it now, the Internet of Things embedded in everything uh, right down to critical infrastructure and not have security issues rise to the top or have governments uh, that naturally are engaging competitive behavior start thinking about warfare implications. All of that, I think, was inevitable. It's a question of what do we do about it now, and that's why I think, frankly, speaking about some kind of arms control in this domain is critical right now. Yeah, thank you. I've got a... Qu oh, right. I've got some questions from the audience. Why don't we um, take that? I want to... Oh, I think the gentleman there has been waiting for a little longer, so let's just 
Get in first. Um, Please introduce yourself. And Walid, then. Walid as Sakat is my name. I'm also a cyber steward, so I'm connected to the citizen lab. Um, but I'm also an academic. I teach here at Örebro University in Sweden, though I come from Yemen, as you can tell, I'm not Swedish. <laughs> uh, the thing is that I can relate to the aspect of academics being challenged. And uh, one example is DARPA. We all know that the internet came as one by um, products of, uh, projects of DARPA. Uh, yet, at the same time, uh, we see DARPA using uh, new technologies, efforts to use, utilize drones, for example, for Wi-Fi spots. And this is one project that they are coming up with, aging drones. As one a person coming from Yemen, you may know that I'm not so favorable of drones, <laughs> as you can tell. Uh, there's this distrust in technology uh, developers in the developing world uh, as, I mean, in uh, the West and US in particular. But when it comes to academics, I come back here to the question of ethics. I mean, where do we draw the line? And what technology could be utilized in ways that may end up harming more than helping? And uh, in fact, uh, I can tell you that many times uh, I confront students of mine, asking them, what do you believe academics in the US and others are doing? They claim to uh, think that there is connection, there's a connection of certain agendas by government. So yeah. this is a problem that we face constantly in the developing world. Enrique Pirasses, do you want to come, come in on that yes. point? Hi, Walid. So I would say uh, this may be an insufficient response, but I'll, uh, I think may contribute. Um, I think that it will be impossible to put barriers to the development of technology. Technology will not stop. And I think that uh, the way we could draw lines is around not technology but policy. We need to make sure that uh, next to the development of any technology, it is very clear how uh, accountability for its misuse will be applied and how is that transparency around its implications will be shared with others. And who, who will do that? I think that for that to happen and to define the who, I think that we need to go back to what I tried to bring, brought to the conversation a, a while ago, and is the, the role of civil society. I think that we are uh, missing the opportunity to empower civil society to become that actor that could satisfy that gap that governments, corporations, standards institutions will be unable to, uh, uh, to cover. And, um, and I, I will argue that it will be a, a good way to start to answer that question over time. I've got Patrick and Renata wanting to come in on this point, and then I want to get more future-looking, and I know that we've got some questions. So very, very quick responses, and then I'm going to come to this lady. And then the, let's start to talk, and please start to tweet about what you see as the solution to that. I think we've had a, quite a good exposition of the problem space. Let, now let's see what can different actors do to restore that trust. So... Uh, Renata then, oh, no, let's do Patrick then Renata, go on. <laughs> okay, just decide what order we should do this, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so I also wanted to move forward a little bit here and I think we should think about what people use the trust for, okay. Is it to be able to share information? Is it to sort of judge the, the information you receive? Is it you as an individual? Is it you as an organization? Uh, is it the case that you must share information but you don't really, but you do a selection based on the trust? And so I think we need to take a step back instead of sort of talking about trust. We need to talk about the various mechanisms that were built on the, the fact that we had some trust. So, for example, like Ron said, this would happen anyways, the situation we're in at the moment. I saw myself, the scale of the Internet, force the trust relationship we had between individuals to be changed to be trust between organizations. That is a big step that I think by itself would have created exactly the same situation. And now, because of what has happened, we are back into more individual like trust relationships again, unfortunately. So I think we, we have to sort of stop talking about trust and talk about the various different kind of systems that are built upon the fact we have it or not. So talk about function and need yes. and, the, and the, the need for trusted channels, perhaps, yes. rather than... Is it a need to share information? Yeah. Is it a need to know that, that tools and devices work the way you want? And how do you solve that problem? Renata and then... Well, I, I kind of defer a little bit uh, on his point, but I will discuss it later. Uh, what I, I want to discuss is about uh, how to include different actors from different communities that are excluded from the conver conversation. And I think that we need uh, to find a way to 
uh, reduce the complexity or inform about the complexity of the issues. I, I prefer to understand what's going on, that there's no need to know, no need to care about approach. Also, uh, the, the topic, uh, also uh, to address the issue of access to information, uh, because secrecy on the private sector is done through the trade secrets and how to protect my, my innovation and so on. And I don't have I don't have obligation to disclose, and and the public the, the public sector uh, national security is the 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 excess of the national security concerns and the increase of secrecy, and also I want to mention gender, because I know that it's not the center of the conversation, but it's worth mentioning that this community is a bunch of white guys, so. Uh, in, probably in basements full of computers. So I think that it's important to remember that, uh, to create the incentives, and that's the task of private sector and governments to make sure that we are building communities that represent the 50% of the population. Well, I don't know if, if you would agree with me, Renata, but I often view these communities as a bit like the wizarding world in Harry Potter, and I'm definitely a muggle when it comes to this, and that these are the true bloods, and that they, they share information amongst each other because they have the um, uh, academic background and intellectual capacity and a way of doing things. And I think as the net and the governance of the net becomes more internationalised, we need to challenge our way of doing things. So, OK, thank you. Okay. Just speak, and okay, hopefully it will be. My comment is directly following on what you just said, Renata. I, mean, I think there are um, so many aspects to the community, whether you're talking about journals, which are very hard for non-Western academics to get into, in terms of language, which is primary, primarily English, and even when you have initiatives, like I just used to work at UNESCO, they're doing an initiative to create an Arabic glossary, but it's a very like old school approach. I've tried to connect activists with that community, but it's not happening. You have you know, UNESCO creating studies about internet intermediaries, about cybersecurity, about internet privacy, et cetera. They're all being led by Western, often American um, people. Luckily, some women, I think it is becoming easier for women to gain entry, but there's definitely a gender divide. And I think identifying the problems helps us come up with some of the solutions, which are we have to create, um, we have to have things happening in different languages. And we have to be able to discuss these concepts in Arabic in you know in Brazil in Portuguese you know etc. And similarly, that there has to be, especially at the United Nations level, more of an effort to reach out to the global South, you know, to those traditionally disenfranchised voices. But it's and it's the same with funding. When you fund groups, um, this going to exactly what Ron said in terms of the knowledge transfer. Western governments are funding Western groups to go out and train activists. So you have. An, as I mentioned in the previous session, an overabundance of funding for cyber, you know, for um, circumvention, security, et cetera. And someone mentioned on Twitter, why don't we talk about cyber peace? Yeah. This is a totally yeah. non-dominant discourse. Okay, yeah. thank, thank you. The, the remote moderator. Yeah, the, I want to <laughs> highlight this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, sorry. Yeah, I, I think uh, internet would uh, agree with that. I, I, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> the internet, uh, yeah. internet says yes. Yeah. But we don't trust uh, it. No, of course. Uh, but uh, the one question that was raised was uh, raised was that uh, the, the, there could be an issue with trying to, to join uh, different thoughts into some kind of trust uh, perspective, since actually when when trust is defined, it could be hard to to change the definitions. Yeah. Thank you. I want to yeah. come to you, Moez, and, and then to, I want to have a sort of think about how we go forward in, in a positive way. And uh, it's you three okay. I'm really going to be focusing on. <laughs> so I think, Moez Chachuk, in your role in Tunisia, taking over as CEO of the organization that used to do the national internet censorship, could you just share with us? You know, that this is obviously an environment where trust would be fairly low and need to be rebuilt. Could you just share with us some of the practical steps you have been taking to rebuild trust? Yeah, I mentioned that uh, we, we were open to the society, but uh, it's not just open because I can mention also the case of, about the Freedom Online Coalition meeting that held in Tunisia last year. It was in 2013, June 2013. And uh, during that conference, 
And I think that, that, that conference, it was a very good opportunity for the Tunisian community to be able to involve in the, in the, in, in the broader debate about the Snowden revelations, because it was just 10 days after the first revelations about Snowden. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was also an opportunity to understand and, to, and to, to understand what is the meaning of, uh, of internet freedom and how we can guarantee and how, 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 how can we safeguard the privacy and how can we safeguard the, the freedom of expression. Because, you know, uh, if you ask in the street or Tunisian, we say, the thing that we have really won from this Arab Spring is just freedom of expression. And uh, if, if, if after three years today we feel that we have a good constitution but we don't have a really, really good implementation of that constitution, that means that we are least on threats. But we need to work on it with the, with, with, with the community. So the Freedom Online Coalition was uh, really important because uh, the, the, the society was involved in the organization. They helped, they did everything. It is a government for sure. A conference of meeting, but uh, the civil society were in in the conference and uh, helped all all the all the people to to, to mm. get in that conference. What is next? I can mention about uh, during that conference we, we we opened the the ITI headquarters. It was uh, the 404 labs. You know, 404 labs is like a joke for for some people because it's 404 is for censorship, mm. and uh, it so is that's the open. error message that would appear when yeah, a web page had been censored 404. Exactly, exactly. and uh, we. There is a, a message given by the community before the revolution saying that ATI is equal to 404. And being uh, convinced that it is, that was true for years because we censored the internet for many years and we said, okay, during the conference of Freedom Online Conference, we raised the, image, the, the message that uh, we transformed the underground of ATI, which was the first uh, space where we tested the, uh, the censorship. And we open it for the community and we say, okay, this is, will be the open innovation uh, lab. And this is, will be an open to all society to work with and to work in it. And uh, it is very, very wor working very well. There's a lot of risks for sure, because when you open the doors to a com for a company to open the doors to the community, you can have uh, anybody coming there and work on it. But uh, it's very wonderful uh, steps forward to, to, so to build it, a new community. It's about community. taking risks, really, risking that sure. chaos of, of lots of people being involved. Yeah, for sure. Being transparent, uh, when we talk to, with, with, with politicians, they said not being transparent at all because they have always threats you know, coming from the society. And mm. I think there's always a risk, but we need to take this risk because we, we have the same objective. We want to develop our economy, we want to develop our society, and we need to develop our internet. So this is something that we need to tackle it. And, and this, this can be done. And Simone Hallink, from, the, from your perspective within government, what is being done by the Dutch government uh, and what needs to be done? Could you, could you talk to us a little bit about the Freedom Online Coalition and the, the Cyberspace Conference next year and how you see these as, as doing their bit? Yeah, um, I think there's two main things that I could mention. Uh, first of all, there in the, the Freedom Online uh, Conference was in Tallinn about a month ago, if I'm... Um, and our Minister of Foreign Affairs. Last three. <laughs> um, they underlined um, his explicit commitment. There's giants. <laughs> I, I think. Some but if we get, um, uh, get your mic sorted, and Enrique. Um, <laughs> okay, that, uh, why yeah. don't you try this? Listen, Listen, so we don't interrupt Enrique your point. Her, her microphone and then talk into the handle. <laughs> yeah, let me see if this works. Yeah, it stays away. Um, so in, in Tallinn, uh, Minister, uh, Minister Timmermans under, underlined his ex explicit uh, commitment to the to multi-stakeholder model, but also said, well, we have to make sure that we sort of you know, like explain what that means. And here I see two things that the Dutch government is doing. The first um, is the cyberspace conference next year, which will be organized in April. Um, and this is, has originally been a governmental, uh, very much governmental uh, conference. And there's lots, been lots of critique, critique on this. And so it's one of the... Okay. Can we just put it up? I'm going to, I'm going to take a couple of questions from the audience. En Enrique, yes, please. So I want you to talk about concrete actions that are being taken within civil society. It's muted. So I, there, there's two <laughs> things that speak to the, the next steps, but I, that rely for me to touch two things that were said before. So I will ha have to be that person that disagrees with both Peter and the internet. I don't think that we're seeing an issue around <laughs> the semantics of trust. Yeah. I, I will strongly disagree <laughs> with that, at least because I think it's incomplete. I think that we have learned enough and we know now that the issues that we have with trust are around participation, the lack of participation in particular, accountability, the lack of accountability, 
and transparency, in particular, the lack of transparency. So I, I think that we have learned enough, and any next step will require that yeah. we, you know, put at least some mitigation measures in that yeah. direction. The second bit to this has to do with, uh, you know, how is that we can imagine any step moving forward. I think that we have learned also that governments are necessary, but again, insufficient. And I think that any effort that can help us improve the state of rights in the internet era will require that we move away from the exclusive vision of international cooperation as to include transnational solidarity. And in that sense, we have learned through many, many years of solidarity between civil society among regions that Uh, yeah, I didn't want to cut off Enrique, uh, but um, it's a good follow for that moment of tech noise. Um, I, 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 I was uh, thinking, when we're talking about the future, it really feels like I'm thinking William Gibson, you know, the future has arrived, but it's not distributed evenly, mm -hmm. and it feels a lot like that. Um, so I, I, I think um, whether we might introduce into this discussion of the epistemic communities, primarily it's been from the axis of trust, and I think Enrique and the last few comments are moving us away and adding to that axis. And I just wanted to name it as perhaps we should be talking a little bit about from the axis of power dynamics. Because when you talk about transparency and accountability and participation, it's really getting around this, this empowerment uh, uh, challenge. Because I think that's the bigger challenge. Like We could solve these different communities, can trust each other within their communities, but I don't think it will affect the fundamental problem of empowerment of communities that now do not have access or control over information or over the resources to create that or the resources to share it and over policy making. So I think uh, sort of another axis to add to this, making it a little more 3D, is perhaps to, to talk about these issues. Of, it's not just trust, that it really has to do with power dynamics. It's kind of like in a domestic violence situation. They're talking about trust, trust, mediation, you know, come to a solution but it's fundamentally at heart an unequal power relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Lady at the back. Please introduce yourself and then ask your question. Oh, is he me? Just keep talking and the mic will come on. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, Carolina Rossini from Brazil. Um, I don't know if I'm gonna be too practical, but sometimes I think we need to be practical and give small steps because by the end of, of a couple of months or years, you may actually change something really important, right? So about, we are discussing here trust. So I wanna invite us to think and to actually just start trusting, right? If you give your first step and trust, and by that I mean by sharing, by trying to build coalitions, by knocking on the door of people repeatedly, that come through at some point. But that, of course, is a process operational issue because you don't bring to coalitions together if you do not have a common goal, right? And I think that's our bigger challenge here besides the pro pro process. And there are tons of other communities that many of us are engaged through that can help the process. You have the open access community uh, to publications, you have the open translation community, you have the free software community, you have all these communities that can help us with process, the open data community, the open government community, whatever. So all, everything you can put open, there is a community there to help you with process, right? But on the go, why don't we elect some core documents or some core meetings that actually uh, come through in resolutions and try to work together on, uh, on some uh, abstract level? So that's a proposal, right? We are seeing the WISIS reviewing process. We have the net mundial outcome document. We have some, uh, and the, go the companies wanna do that. In US, I'm based in US now, uh, you had the, one report evaluating the NSA program and the PRISM program, right? Can we form a working group around that and propose some changes? So, Okay, uh, so I'm um, uh, sorry to, to cut across. I just want to get other speakers as well. So we've got a question here about that we must discuss power and empowerment along with trust and that also a concrete suggestion for action, a coalition, uh, to, you know, to work on these issues. Can, can I have some responses? Sure. Yep. Ron, and any more questions as well? While you're responding, I'm going to... So the, the point that Sharon makes about uh, 
power, I think, is very important. Mm -hmm. And in fact, connects to issues of transparency and accountability that have been brought up on the panel. Uh, if you look back historically, the principles of transparency and accountability, of course, come from the liberal democratic tradition, which at its heart is about uh, tying down and restraining the exercise of power, making it accountable, bringing it within a framework of the rule of law. And I think when we discuss the issues that we're discussing here, uh, we, we in the liberal democratic countries have lost sight of some of those basic principles. We need to restore them uh, from the bottom up. And I think one other comment I'll make, a very important point Enrique makes about civil society needing to be part of the distributed mechanism of checking and constraining power and, and acting as uh, vehicles of transparency and accountability. Part of that must include something that I said last year at CIF, that civil society needs a strategy for cybersecurity, including how to deal with issues around cybercrime. Uh, these are often wished away or talked about as if there's some kind of ruse that's created by people in power, uh, and it can sometimes be that, but there are in fact serious issues about uh, cybercrime and threats to the infrastructure that have to be dealt with just on a practical level, because we depend on these technologies to do what we do as well. So I've got everybody from the panel wanting to come in. I've got several questions from the audience. Patrick, I'm going to come to you, and then there's a gentleman at the back. Can I, I just ask you to keep your interventions really brief so we can get as many voices as possible, even if we sacrifice some coherence for that? What the lady pointed out in the back, that we should use communities. I think that is what I said earlier. Use communities and other mechanisms to solve the problem that we need to solve when we don't have trust. I think okay. building the trust cannot really be the goal anymore. I think we need to solve the problems. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so to just get on with practical things. Yes. Enrique. Um, thanks, Peter. I agree with that quite a bit. Uh, speaking of to some, something that our colleague from Brazil also said, is I'm very glad that uh, she brought the example of uh, the open and free, so, uh, free source uh, and free software communities. I think that one thing that we can learn from those movements is uh, that we should talk less and do more, yeah. and that we should do more in short periods of time, even with uh, the potential notion of failure. So I would agree with uh, you know learning from those processes as long as we can decide to move and, you know, talk a bit less. Yes, I think you're channeling Cyber Doge there with the <laughs> blah, 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 action, no. Oh, well. <laughs> so in the last 12 minutes, um, let's have a couple more questions. But can we just think about, you know, w we talk about problems and we think it's up to other people to solve them. Can we think about what we ourselves, what actions, small actions we can take to restore trust or just keep things moving? Um, in, in these last few minutes and go action, yes. Um, my Just keep talking. Okay. So my question uh, to the panel... No, it would actually be... Uh, so I'm Sasha, I'm from the internet. Uh, my question uh, would actually be, what would be our next step to make sure that we connect our communities that are quite strong and, and formed over the years at these conferences and at other places to those other communities and communities that call themselves the community mm -hmm. um, to, uh, to have a narrative in which we can listen to each other. And another a more specific point would be, would it be interesting to look at like the narratives around the responsibility to protect, uh, to, uh, to look at these questions and to look at what states should actually do in this context? Thank you. Renata, any more questions, please? Uh, should I go ahead? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so basically, I totally agree on that, and I think that uh, we have to justify our presence here. I mean, it is not just, it shouldn't be like this community. Sh we, we are very privileged of having access to yeah. this information yeah. and to having access to this network. And it depends, uh, and there's very little accountability on what we are doing when we go back home. And I think that in this specific task, in, uh, in this specific topic, the task is to go map and connect and know who is the guy or the uh, woman doing this on your country. I mean, many, ma in many countries you don't even know who is this special uh, team who is dealing with these emergency issues on the internet. And so go, uh, go and, and uh, either by the uh, direct channels or by the indir indirect channels, fill uh, freedom of information requests, ask who is dealing with that, ask who is going to the technical conferences, who is, and then share back to the international community. So we, 
keep an eye on what's going on on, on all of these topics. And for the uh, balancing of power topic, I will say that the only north that we have is the interna international human rights frame. And that should be our north and our limit, our, our guidance and our, um, let's say, Bible uh, to, to, to limit power, to keep all, all citizens equal and all states equal, and to keep uh, the human rights preserved. So just, just very, very briefly, I'm sorry, I cannot let this one go. <laughs> I think, Sasha, thanks for bringing this up. I think that there's a very specific thing that we can do, and it's within this community, and it's that we should start to show how trust works. Like, yeah. we should start to work more together, start to do less duplicated work, start to compete less for the same things. So let's, let's just act by example. Let's yes. just lead by example. Thank sorry. you. Thank you very much. Simone? Yeah, um, I think it works or it doesn't work. Yeah. Does it work? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I want to come back to Sasha and uh, Renata's uh, remark, uh, the responsibility to protect, but also the human rights framework for cybersecurity will be important topics at the Cyberspace Conference next year, as will multi-stakeholder participation um, and the whole topic of internet freedom, privacy and freedoms in general. And so I encourage every, everyone who has spe spe specific ideas about like, what should be discussed on that conference to come to me and to share those ideas. Thank you. Uh, Carolina. Yes, my, my name is Carolina Guerri. Um, I come from Latin America. Um, and uh, I work with, a lot with CCTLDs and the technical community. So um, when we're talking about epistemic communities, and even to be even more specific, we're talking about shared values, norms, and beliefs. I mean, and so that is what, at the end of the day, brings trust. And um, I specify that, that I come from a developing region because epistemic communities in in certain countries uh, in the developing world arrived, the internet community arrived sort of at the same time, or maybe just a little bit earlier than governments. And it's it's a very different story when you're talking about a community that was sort of less well established and those practices were less well developed. So um, I really think uh, that one way to move forward is to strengthen this technical communities in developing regions which have yeah. this kind of epistemic community way of mechanism of working so that then they can engage yeah. with governments and with other stakeholders yeah. in a more sort of fruitful way yeah. to push this forward. I so uh, yeah, I'm hearing this that, that uh, modeling good behavior uh, sharing good practices you yeah, know, I agree with this, exemplifying this exactly. uh, uh, yes ron and then moes okay, no, okay. so um I, one practical thing you're talking about practical solutions that we could try to focus on now for me uh, a, a very uh, uh an idea that i that i uh, hold very closely and, and want to encourage is the important role of universities in this space that we're talking about. I think somebody mentioned earlier DARPA as Waleed. Uh, it's true, DARPA, internet, that whole story, but equally important is a, a diff slightly different narrative, and that's that it is out of the university system and many of the principles that the heart of the university around uh, peer sharing and trust and reputation, out of which the internet emerged. And I think the university has kind of lost sight of its special role and responsibility that it has to play in ensuring a secure, secure and open internet globally. Uh, part of the problem is that within universities, you have disciplinary divides. You have the social sciences, which have no technical training. You have engineering and computer sciences with very little uh, attention to ethical privacy issues, social issues. And yet the students who are enrolling, I see this as professors, are eager to do both now. We need to transform that in terms of the disciplinary divides and then have universities stand up and act as custodians of a secure and open global internet, which could be a very powerful force from civil society and a distributed mechanism of control at a global level. Yeah, I will push, yeah, exactly. I, agree, I totally agree because uh, it's very important for to, to build the trust and to educate people and, do, and, and, to, and to raise the awareness of, of people. And, and, and this starts from, from the school, I would and say not the university, but from the school, exactly. And is your experience doing your work in Tunisia, yeah, is, is trust getting, because it must be very hard given where you come from to... Yeah, yeah, but uh, it's, it it's by acting, already? it's by acting. We need to be present in, in different forums. We need to be present in the university to, to, to talk about the experience. And uh, this is very important because we show them that what we had done during these years in order to, to build this new trust uh, with, with, with ITI. But what is important is to mention that instead of 
buying weapons, of surveillance weapons. It's better to, to educate people and, and, to, and to raise awareness. And this is, for a, for, for, for a country like mine now, we have a lot of threats coming from terrorism, you know, on the borders. And uh, the response of many government officials is saying that we need to counter these, these attacks by buying much more surveillance or doing something that is very, very worse for the, for, for the internet. I think the education is the key essential. But your issue. government's yeah, not yeah. alone in that, of course. Yeah, we know. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Martin, is there anything happening on the Twitter feed? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the gender issue is actually kind of burning. As well. Ah, so good, good. <laughs> But I, I think that's important because we're talking about the, the common co communities, so to yeah. speak. Yeah, so do you think that there is... Um, so, um, Simone, Renata, that would, would you like to, to respond on the gender issues? Do you think that there is some benefit in creating, um, you know, uh, epistemic communities of, of women in well, this space? I, I would say that it's transversal. There are 50% of the population. And even it's the women community. The point here is... That Yeah, we are we are not there, and, and I see very little commitment. It is not just having two women in the panel. It requires work. It requires oh, three, three, three. Uh, and the moderator. Uh, it requires, uh, and we are like if you see at us, we are uh, highly privileged, educated women. So uh, we need to work hard on this, and this this is not just in cyber issues. It's in, in the in whole, uh, all Thank our you. life, yeah. It's Simone Hallink, and then I've had a special dispensation that we can, because we were 10 minutes late starting, that we can go on a little bit later if we like. Um, so I'm just going to ask the audience for another round of questions. So please think about your question, put up your hand. Simone. No, I think it's a very difficult question, question because, in essence, if you're talking about technology, there's not that many female technologists. So, like, there needs to be, there needs to, something needs to change at the basis. And, I, I, you know, like, I, I don't have an expla explanation for why that is, but um, we need more women to participate if we want to cha change the discourse. And here, just as sort of a, a first suggestion, I would sort of make a suggestion to women, at least women here, that we have the Freedom Online uh, uh, Coalition Working Group on uh, cybersecurity issues, which I haven't yet mentioned. And what the purpose of the group is actually to, to introduce the human rights framework within cybersecurity discourse. And one of the first goals we've set ourselves is to sort of make recommendations on how the multi-stakeholder should be sort of developed uh, within this, this context. And we've opened... Um, an application online for people interested, so I would um, encourage everyone that is interested in discussions that we've had here to look at that um, uh, application and see if it's something for you. Thank you very much. Any more questions from the audience? Don't be shy. Well, I forgot to mention something okay. on, the, on women issues. Specifically for security issues, the UN has a resolution, the 1425 uh, resolution, and it mandates that women are included in all the talks and all the policies related to security. So this cyber security is a good um, pilot project that we should uh, try to include women in this discourse. And we have the frame and, you, and the UN mandate uh, the state members to do so, so let's use it. Okay, can I just ask you, yes? Yeah, the idea there. Okay, you're ready to go, Ron. You've got the microphone, and there's a lady down here who would like to ask a question. So, okay, I, I w it's kind of a, a concluding comment uh, since we're getting close to the end of time. But I think so that, that just uh, ask for that. oh, okay. <laughs> um, well. Uh, I think it's become clear to me that there are a couple of basic things that are, are obvious to this discussion that are worth repeating. One is. Uh, when we talk about issues as we have been today, it's clear to me uh, that the value of open source is fundamental to this open issue, source. especially after you know what for many people in public, maybe not in this audience, was novel when the Snowden revelations come out to see uh, exactly how uh, proprietary closed systems could be used to exercise power secretly. If we're going to ever solve that problem, it's clear that that needs to be overcome. The way to do it is through uh, free and open source. Um, uh, I think another related issue is uh, around 
something I think Enrique talked about, which is a civic attitude, which I think uh, the hacktivist community, as you call it, the hacker community, we need to restore a positive sense at a cultural level of what that means. Yeah. And it's something I've been going about for a long time. Many people probably heard me say this, but I think we need to restore that positive notion of hacking. Uh, you know, restore the idea that it's okay to ask questions about the technological environment around you. It's per perverse when people are thrown in jail or driven to suicide when all they want to do is explore and open up technology and understand mm -hmm. how it works. We need to change that at the most basic fundamental level, starting with young people and working out and developing a, a civic attitude of questioning not only authority, but the technological systems that surround us. Yeah. No, I just wanted to share good news. Thank you. Yes. Yes, no, I just wanted to share um, our experience a little bit in terms of how to link the open source community in Central America with human rights defenders. And this has been a huge challenge for Acceso, but we're striving, you know, with uh, uh, bringing young people, fresh people with new ideas, new methodologies, and, and that can translate all the technical information to the common people that are human rights defenders and that are in risk. And this has been a very good lesson and we're learning a lot. Can you share it with everyone else as well? Please? Yes, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, it's an initiative that we're uh, strengthening security in human rights organizations. And we've linked uh, open source communities and technical people that are socially committed. And this is something very difficult because, uh, as you said, uh, basically technical people are not very involved in social movements, for example. So we've identified women and men, uh, more difficult women, but they're there. <laughs> and we're also trying to strengthen their participation at the technical level and digital security and also in terms of trust, this is something very important because we work with human rights organizations and we have access to their information. And this is something that trust is built, but it also has to be ethical and it has to be a framework to work. Uh, how does Accesso manage their information securely? You know, and this has to do also with an ethical positioning of a technical person that is visiting the organization and supporting them in security issues. So it's a, it's a beautiful ex yeah, experience. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Alejandro Pisanti. I tweet as a Pisanti, National University of Mexico. Um, I think uh, I, I, I want to praise everybody for putting together this panel and pushing it forward. I think that the build up of uh, an epistemic community and other communities around cyber security is important. I have mentioned that mentioning cyber run uh, brings in the state and borders and uh, we should be careful about the nomenclature there. It not, not, not go so I easy. blame cyber doge for that. I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, now we have someone to blame. Uh, I think the conversation is not going to be complete until we bring in people who know uh, more about uh, surveillance governance. We're speaking about cyber governance, internet governance, but we need to bring in people who know how intelligence agencies work, how law enforcement agencies work. Uh, I think that uh, from, the, from the global south, wherever that is, uh, we look at uh, some of these conversations about making transparency and accountability start in, uh, in, you know, in, in uh, northern Canadian or American uh, US and, uh, uh, intelligence communities. And uh, we look at this as uh, white men problems, uh, first, first world problems, rich people's problems. Uh, do you want to polish your Rolls Royce uh, silvery or, or, or golden? Uh, we think that forces, even in those countries, are actually undermining activists and the press in many ways that are for which regulation is irrelevant because there will never be a lawsuit based on that kind of information. And uh, until we begin to separate these layers more and then understand, as Patrick has said, how uh, you accept some layer violations, like changing technology to adapt to these things, uh, this conversation will, let's say, I won't say this conversation will be complete. I hope that over the next year, this is a conversation that can actually hold. Thank you. So the involvement of, of uh, people who know about surveillance, I'm going to go to Patrick and then to you, Enrique. And then we'll just uh, we'll start to wrap up after that. Sure, no, I absolutely agree with that. And, and I think the, the, the conversations need to include, if I, if I like polarize things like both the business side, 
the, the civil society and others which have their interests and then law enforcement which have certain responsibilities and any kind of discussion which is sort of dominated by any of the three parties will be skewed and not really lead to results that will be helpful. So I, I, I cannot do anything else than, uh, than, uh, than um, supporting emphasizing what Ron said, how important it is with open source that you can actually inspect and validate either directly or indirectly through parties that you trust certification mechanisms and other kind of agreements. It's also sort of an in, indirect trust you might get, but not only in open source, but also open standards. You started by talking to, about the ITF, and I think that it's also very important to be able to access and, and participate in the creation of standards as well, and also the using more open standards instead of what I see on the internet today, where people are using less and less standards, and that's really, really bad. Um, and, uh is it true, Patrick, that the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, is working on a number of different projects relating to enhancing security of the basic uh, protocols? The, the basic absolutely. The, the, it has been, what has happened is, during the last year or two, there has been a reprioritization regarding security, just like what happened, I think, 15 years ago, when I was more active, when we changed the prioritization of internationalization, where we saw internationalized domain names and other things, sort of evolve and now you see the same thing in security. So that, so that, that might well bear fruit. Enrique. Um, thanks, uh, Alejandro. I, I want to say something to that. I, I, I agree with you. I think that there needs to be more involvement from some of these other communities. However, uh, I would say that uh, we should build some time before that happens. I think that right before doing that, we need to build a we need to build a bit more of social infrastructure. I think that it's, the conversation may be a little bit uh, unbalanced at this moment from a potential power distribution perspective. Uh, and in doing so, I think that we have the opportunity to, in some way, reconstruct a little bit of the existing social infrastructure to make it a little bit more open. So is the one that is uh, trustworthy. So I'm Point just... clarification, I mean people who know these <laughs> they, I mean, you may, I, I am not saying bring in the CIA or the NSA. I'm saying bring They're here, probably. Who knows. Okay. Thanks. So yeah, are there any more last, very, very quick questions? Oh, nearly got away with it. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I am Ton Sisma, I work for Bits of Freedom. And I had a question. So we've talked about open source software and open standards, and that's, that's all good. But I think it's time to focus on uh, the proprietary legislation, and pro the proprietary way the executive branch is, is, is using their powers. And I don't think that when we try to, um, well, I've, I've seen a lot of talk on uh, lowering bars and, and, and demolishing silos. Um, I don't think that will change the way uh, the government operates. Wow. Anyone want to have well. a last go at that question? Rob? Well, I, I think we have to recognize that, uh, you know, a, a necessary evil of social interaction and life in general among human beings is we need a government. And we need to think about how we design government. And that means checks and balances. Obviously, it doesn't always work. And we have so many instances of abuse all over the world. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't abandon the concept altogether for an alternative that, in my opinion, would be far worse. So, so just in the last 30 seconds, and I'm sorry, I know that everyone wants to still comment, but we, we talked about communities of, of trust and that it isn't a single community, but it can be many. And that actually, that, that it's easy for us as individuals to criticize what is not happening, but rather than to look to what we are empowered to do and, and the small steps that we can make. We've, we've seen very positive steps in post-revolutionary Tunisia to, to try to rebuild trust or work within civil society groups to, to, to work on how to share data and protect people and encrypt in a distributed way, work in the Internet Engineering Task Force to improve uh, security of the basic protocols. Yes, there are many, many problems. Um, the future can look r rather bleak um, if, we, if we review the last 12 months. However, we can't put back the clock. We must march forward yeah. and to try to do uh, something uh, within our own capacity and our own I empowerment to to make things better and, and hopefully to work across our communities as well. I would like to thank you all for your excellent participation and questions. And of course, I'm sure you'd like to thank our wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you.